bow actually indicates a, a respect for one another. The teacher and the students equally worthy of respect. So our subject is compassion. And I'd like to talk tonight about what I know of compassion, what I've learned from my teacher, Chogyam Trungpa, what I've learned from the meditation practices that I've done, what I've learned from just living my life about compassion. There's a lot of misunderstandings about compassion. I think people think of it, generally speaking, when you hear the word, it has a lot of uh, very idealistic connotations. Maybe it even reminds people of uh, Hallmark cards. <laughs> but my experience of Compassion is that uh, it has to do with our relationship with pain. That we learn true compassion as we begin to have a more open-hearted and open-minded relationship with our own pain. So there's various words that I would like to refer to in this talk. And one word is Maitri. Another word is uh, mindfulness, awareness, meditation. And another is Tonglen meditation. So first is Maitri. Maitri is the uh, basis of compassion. So I want to talk about that first. It's a Sanskrit word that uh, is often translated as unconditional friendship with oneself. And this is very hard to come by, unconditional acceptance, you could say, of yourself unconditional friendship with oneself. It was much more common that we disapprove of ourselves and that we denigrate ourselves. Like I saw a cartoon recently, and there's this a man kneeling by his bed, looking upward, with his hands uh, grasped in prayer, and he's saying, I asked you as nicely as I could <laughs> to make me a better person, but apparently you couldn't be bothered. <laughs> so my tree is about... Um, beginning to make friends with oneself, not uh, really thinking that it's going to come from the outside anymore. And as you know, we all look to the outside, to other people, to spiritual practice, meditation, jogging. <laughs> we look all over the place to try to make ourselves feel good about ourselves. And, you know, affirmations are all about that. You sort of proclaim, I am smart. I am good-looking. I am worthy of being loved. And you sort of scream it, you know, and all the time something in you is saying, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so where does this friendship, a kind of being able to relax with yourself, that's really what Maitri is, feeling at home with your own mind and your own body. Where does that come from? 
That's a very important question. Because not only is it the basis of compassion, it's the basis of, it's like the seed of happiness or well-being or glad to be alive. So where does it come from? And I think my opening statement was that all of this has a lot to do with our relationship with pain, our relationship with difficulty. So the Buddha had um, very revolutionary teaching. And one of the fundamental uh, things that he said was, in a human life there is pain, and uh, a certain amount of pain is inevitable, such as uh, growing old, such as dying. That's the most inevitable one. Such as illness, such as the more that you love, and loving is something that brings tremendous sense of well-being to all of us, to actually love somebody and feel loved. But the more stronger that is, then the more sadness and grief there is at the loss of that person. And such as if you put your hand in fire, it burns. So there's a lot of discomfort in life. And the fundamental teaching of the Buddha was not to struggle against the pain in our life. And that's not the kind of news that we really like to hear. (laughs) But it turns out to be an extremely important thing to contemplate. Is it really true that not struggling any longer with the discomfort of our life, say the embarrassment of being oneself, not struggling with that, but instead beginning using meditation as a tool to move closer to oneself. That means becoming intimate with comfort and discomfort, with pleasure and pain, with grief and with joy, with embarrassment and a feeling of success. So, you know, generally speaking, we think in terms of pairs of opposites. And there's something that's called the eight worldly dharmas. And there are these pairs of opposites, and I didn't write them down, and I never can remember them, but they go something like this. I think they're um, victory and defeat. You want the victory part, right? And definitely not defeat. There's praise and blame. Ooh, which do you prefer? (laughs) There's pleasure and pain. There's loss and gain. And the teaching is that as human beings, we're born to think that if we get praise instead of blame, then that's where happiness lies. And if we get pleasure instead of pain, that's where happiness lies. And if we get gain instead of loss, that's where happiness lies. And the Buddha's teaching was that that is not where happiness lies. Because those things are so transitory and so limited, you get a momentary satisfaction. My friend said to me, you know, this teaching would sell like hotcakes if there was never any gratification. But the fact is, there is gratification from praise, say. There's gratification from a lot of things. You can be addicted to alcohol, addicted to drugs, addicted to sex, addicted to all kinds of things, and there's definitely gratification when you drink that drink or whatever you do. But it has a hangover. And it doesn't add up. That was what my friend was saying. If there was no gratification, then people could really buy the stuff. But the fact is, because there's a kind of like temporary happiness, 
that comes from buying things, for instance. Ooh, feels so good. Go out, buy something beautiful and new. You look so good. House looks so good. Kids are so happy. Something is better. But it doesn't add up. So, Buddha said is happiness, root of happiness is beginning to live your life in a way that kind of opens up. Your mind opens up, your heart opens up, and you say, it includes all of this stuff. It includes victory and defeat, praise and blame, loss and gain, pleasure and pain. It includes it all. And that the root of happiness is thinking bigger like that, knowing somehow that it's in being able to um, embrace it all, and that that is the root of happiness, and struggling against the unpleasant part, the dissatisfaction, struggling against that, and just trying to get it all to come out under the column of victory, gain, pleasure, praise, it doesn't add up to a kind of lasting, indestructible, at home in your world, at home in your body, this feeling of Maitri, a kind of fundamental, unshakable feeling right about yourself and your world. So this Maitri is a very profound thing. And it's not like, um, even though it's, I'm talking of it as a foundation for our life, a foundation for compassion, it's not like it's a beginning step. It goes deeper and deeper and deeper. So I find that every week of my life, there's kind of a deepening of this friendship with myself. Well, one of the aspects of my tree is a deepening of not lying to myself, not able to lie to myself anymore. A kind of one of the main qualities of this my tree is honesty with oneself, not lying to oneself. That is really hard because you don't know you're lying to yourself. And blind spots. And really, literally, this very week, yesterday, in fact, or day before yesterday, just before coming here, there was this kind of uh, deepening awareness of different ways that I had been deceiving myself. I was just telling someone about this. This was thanks to my six-year-old granddaughter thanks to spending a weekend with my beloved six-year-old granddaughter, who when I think of someone I love unconditionally, I always think of her. Thanks to spending one weekend alone with her, I had to acknowledge, I had to give up the self-deception that I didn't have much aggression. (laughs) And then my habit of practicing what I teach and what I practice is when uh, there's the discomfort of, say, like, losing it totally with my six-year-old granddaughter, (laughs) my habit is to not see that as a horrible thing that's happened, but to actually move closer to the feeling of losing it, which is to say to let all the words and the commentary, the right and wrong dialogue about it go and just be there sort of cold turkey with what it feels like to be losing it. And as a result of that, as I moved closer to myself and this experience, it wasn't helping me to not lose it with the sweetheart, granddaughter. But I also realized that losing it was only half of it, the self-deception. The real thing was that I was so embarrassed to be this spiritual teacher that all these people come to, so I, I said, it's like, it's like bribing the kid. Don't tell anyone about grandma. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Alex, this is just between you and grandma. <laughs> and so it's, 
what happens with us is not only do we have parts of ourselves that we find painful, many of us find our rage painful or, or that we're constantly anxious or irritated painful or that disliking someone painful. But there's also the struggling with that, that it just doesn't measure up with the image that you carry around that you would like to present to people. So there's the embarrassment of moving closer to oneself. And all of this is the, the Maitri. Having a sense of humor about this, this is a kind of a sense of humor, honesty. It begins with compassion for yourself. A compassion which is not condoning, but is also not uh, criticizing. It's a compassion which is not in any way trapped in calling yourself right or calling yourself wrong. It's uh, this astoundingly unfamiliar ground between righteous indignation and shame where you just feel completely righteous to be doing whatever you're doing or completely embarrassed. Some kind of um, amazingly unfamiliar but spiritually potent ground between acting out with our words and our actions or repressing, just pushing it under, just not wanting to go there, just not looking at that, somehow telling yourself it's not happening or uh, dissociating completely. That middle ground that's not uh, caught in right, wrong, for, against, that's what is referred to as Maitri. It's also referred to as open heart and open mind, uh, just completely able to hold the paradox of not falling off to the right or to the left, but somehow staying, as they say, on the razor's edge of my tree. It doesn't sound very friendly, razor's edge, but somehow holding your seat. Instead of like me sitting up here holding my seat and then someone over there is saying, this is a terrible talk, and I sort of fall off to the left with shame, and then someone over there is saying, wow, isn't it great what she's saying? I sort of puff up then. And, you know, we, that's what happens, right? We get swayed by praise and blame and all the others. And you lose your seat. You fall off to one direction or the other direction. I call it spinning out. You don't just stay sort of cold turkey with the uh, sensation of praise or the sensation of blame as a felt experience in your body. You spin off. So this is all talking about Maitri as the foundation of compassion. So then comes the second word that I want to bring in, which is mindfulness, awareness, meditation. Because really we can talk about these things until we drop dead. <laughs> but we have to actually do something to be able to see clearly and see clearly with compassion. Neither one of those things are easy. To see ourselves clearly and to see ourselves clearly with compassion. I remember when I first started practicing, my teacher, Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche, he used to always talk about making friends with oneself. Maitri, making friends with oneself. And as I started this mindfulness awareness sitting meditation, which is a practice of moving closer to oneself, sitting down just with your body and your mind, that's all you're doing, just sitting quietly with this body, with this mind, and the training is continually coming back to it. Your mind keeps spinning off, and you just keep coming back to being just right here with yourself. And this is like a clear seeing, a staying. And um, I remember once saying to Rinpoche, I said, Rinpoche, I can see so much more clearly what I do, and it doesn't feel to me very friendly. Friendly with myself, this clear seeing feels more like yuck, you know. <laughs> like um, they say, beginning to meditate, 
It's like your mind is like a pool of water that's all stirred up by winds and very restless and chaotic. So then you begin to meditate and you think what's going to happen is your mind is going to calm down. And that's actually, it does happen like that. And you think what that's going to feel like is peace. No one ever tells you that when the water calms down, then you can see all the old tires and skeletons and <laughs> tin cans and corpses and all your misdeeds, you know, leering up at you from the bottom of this still pool. So seeing clearly is a, honesty is part of my tree toward oneself. So the way I was taught, the language that I was given from the beginning, which I've always found immensely helpful, is it's beginning to discover your own humanness. And this is actually your connection with all other people. Beginning to discover the sharedness of the human condition. That Maitri is discovering your own humanness, knowing it. In Zen tradition, they talk a lot, they use the language of becoming intimate with becoming intimate with what it feels like to be slandered or betrayed, that awful feeling, what it feels like to lose something that's dear to you, that terrible, heartbreaking, dreadful feeling where everything in you wants to shut down, push away, not feel that, becoming intimate with, and also intimate with what it feels like to be praised what it feels like to be loved, what it feels like to be accepted, what it feels like to be a success, the, the uplifted inspiration, becoming intimate with the whole, as Zorba said, the whole catastrophe. So with the mindfulness awareness meditation, one takes a posture, a meditation posture, which usually is cross-legged, but it can be sitting in a chair also. And there's many, many styles that are taught, but the uh, style that I was taught and that I teach is you become aware of your breath going out. You're aware of your body sitting here and aware of your breath going out. And that is the focus of your meditation, is just the awareness, um, almost a sense of feeling the breath going out. And then you notice that your mind wanders off continually, all the time. The nature of mind is it's thinking, thinking, thinking. And uh, whenever you notice that that's what's happening, you keep bringing yourself back, just coming back to being right here with this body, as uncomfortable or comfortable as this body might be feeling. Coming right back to this mood, as uh, disturbed or relaxed as this mood might be. Coming back to this mind, which might be talking. They say sometimes the mind is like a turbulent river or a churned up ocean. And sometimes if you sit for uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes, you see that it's like more kinds of weather than you can count on your fingers, all the different moods and weather changes of the mind. So this is kind of the training in terms of Maitri or making friends with oneself. This is very difficult to do, but straightforward practice of just training in what I like to think of as just staying. Just stay, 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 like training the dog. <laughs> and as you know with uh, dogs, if you train them by uh, hitting them and beating them, they can become very obedient, but they're not flexible. And they're uh, easily terrified and easily confused if everything doesn't go just a certain way. But if you train a dog with love and um, kindness, and a clarity, and then the dog is equally obedient, but also very flexible, has a sense of humor, can uh, roll with the uh, changes. So which kind of dog do you want to be? <laughs> 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 so, 
So when we train ourselves, train the mind, it's with this kindness, with this honesty, but also this gentleness, this kindness. So when we say stay, stay, sort of pith instruction, stay, and then mind goes off and off and off. When the mind goes off, you, you don't just like hit yourself. Bad dog. <laughs> no, you just, uh, you just come back. Give yourself a little doggy treat. <laughs> so it's like, um, someone once said, it's like very naive almost. There's like no big deal about the meditation. Whatever arises in the mind, you just acknowledge that it's there. It's like giving it all the space in the world to just be there, and then you just come back to being in your body with the quality of your mind, of your mood, just being here, present here in the present moment. Then the mind goes off again. They say it's like um, feeding the baby. You put the spoon in the baby's mouth and the baby's attention starts wandering. You don't hit the baby. You just, you know, you say cute things like, you know, here's the birdie or something, and then the baby gets your attention and you stick that spoon in it. So just with that kind of simplicity, you just keep coming back and you repeat it over and over and over. Just this training and staying with yourself. And uh, interestingly enough, this is a training in living without prejudice. It's a fundamental training in non-aggression. And this is living without prejudice towards yourself and fundamental non-aggression towards yourself. So all of this is uh, talking about Maitri and the practice of cultivating the loving kindness or unconditional friendship with oneself, which is so all-inclusive, honest, and friendly. But the talk is about compassion. So then compassion sort of just begins to dawn on you, encouraged by the practice of Tonglen, which is one where you actually cultivate compassion kind of purposely. But it's based not on being kind to other people, but on knowing your own experience, having this uh, unconditional, compassionate, honest relationship with yourself, which, as I said, is discovering your humanness or exploring humanness, exploring the human condition. And then you begin to realize that what you experience is our shared humanity, Your storylines might be different. Our storylines are different. Our life histories are different. But the feeling of anger has been felt the same by men and women and children from the beginning of time. The feeling of anger, anger is is felt in the same way. Jealousy is felt in the same way. There's lots of different things that trigger it, that get it going. But if you let the words go, training in the uh, mindfulness awareness practice, and can sit with just the raw energy of the anger or the jealousy or the craving or the loneliness or the depression, if there's a sense of knowing it, being intimate, without all the words, that is our shared humanity. That is what we all share. So from this actually comes what is really compassion, that compassion is in no way pity or looking down on another person or helping out someone less fortunate in a way that actually can be helpful in a limited way because someone needs food, you give them food. Someone needs money, you give them money or whatever. But if you've ever been on the receiving end of condescending compassion, you know that it really doesn't do much for you because it disempowers you, and you basically feel like someone is seeing you as wounded, as flawed in some way, and that you are pathetic and need to be cared for. And that doesn't, you know, doesn't exactly do it for you. It's not exactly how you want to go around feeling. 
So genuine compassion is when you stand in your own shoes, which could be another way of talking about Maitri, then you are standing in the shoes of other people as well. It's like our shared humanity. So with the Tonglen practice, it's actually built on this realization. Or, on the other hand, you can have no such realization, begin to do the Tonglen practice, and it begins to awaken this realization of our shared humanity. And that is when you feel discomfort in any form, the uh, automatic response is to push that away and to drink something, smoke something, do something, buy something, do something to not feel that. But the Tonglen approach is that you breathe it in, letting the words go, you breathe in the discomfort and own it completely with the thought in your mind that what I am feeling in this very moment is felt by millions and millions of people all over this world. And then you send out that which you feel will bring relief to you in that situation. You send out that which is joyful, that which is uplifted. Sometimes people will send out compassion or just send out some sense of spaciousness or send out a sense of, uh, if they feel that what they're needing right then would be some love, they might send out love to themselves and all the other people who are feeling like they are. But as somebody uh, once said, but you don't have to be too philosophical about it. You could just send yourself a good cup of coffee. But the thing is that it's not like that you're doing this for yourself. You're doing it for every person, every man, every woman. And you know every man and every woman because of knowing yourself. So your experience becomes the stepping stone for understanding the experience of other people. And that kind of compassion is what is real compassion. And that is a relationship between equals. There's no up-down in the relationship. You can look in the eyes of someone who's suffering and be there for them because they don't trigger off all kinds of, uh, or they may trigger off all kinds of unresolved feelings in you, but you know what it is to sit with those feelings, to become intimate with those feelings, to not run away, and therefore you can stay with that person. So it moves from being able to just stay with oneself to being able to stay with all that you encounter in your life, the situations, the people in your life. So this is my understanding of compassion. And this compassion comes from opening oneself through the meditation of the basic sitting meditation and the practice of Tonglen. Just in general, though, just even with this view, even if you never do these practices, just this view that moving closer to your experience instead of trying to run away from it becomes the basis of really being able to open your heart to a multitude of situations, multitude of people which now seem impossible to open your heart to. So you walk down a street, And maybe your aspiration is to keep your heart and mind open for one block. And then actually what that becomes, uh, that becomes a Maitri and compassion block. Because what happens is, because your aspiration is sincere to keep your heart and mind open, never before in your whole life had you noticed how often you shut down. That you can't believe how many people you feel aversion to how many people you don't want to look at, how many people you're, you lust after. Attachment and aversion, attraction and dislike. One short block can um, be quite a strong spiritual practice. So this is my understanding of compassion based on what I've been taught and what I've experienced that it has to do with changing our relationship with pain and with pleasure. Willing not to run from pain and willing not to just hold on to pleasure with a kind of desperation and fear that we're going to lose it. A sense of enjoying, but able to uh, give it away or share it. So the essence of the Tonglen practice is when things hurt, you think to yourself, other people feel this. 
And when things are delightful, something tastes good, you feel cool when you've been hot, or you get something you really wanted, whatever it is, you get in the habit of thinking, may other people enjoy this. Sometimes you think of certain people, people you know are having a tough time. You wish that they could just have, maybe they don't have to get the job you just got, but that they could have the sense of happiness that you're feeling. Or it can be very, very general. You can just wish that other people everywhere could feel this. So somehow compassion is what heals us. Compassion doesn't, when you really understand it, it doesn't burn you out, it heals you because it's a continual feeling of your world opening up and your heart and your mind opening up. And it's a feeling of being more and more relaxed with your own body, your own mind, and the situations and people that you find yourself with. The practice of Tonglen was brought to Tibet in the uh, 10th century by a man named Atisha. He came from India, and he brought with him this practice of Tonglen. And along with the practice of Tonglen, he brought a whole teaching, which has come down to us as something that's called the slogans of Atisha, and there are these 49 different slogans, which all somehow are in the spirit of Tonglen. And the book called Training the Mind by Trumpa Rinpoche, a little blue book, gives all of these slogans. And the book that uh, I wrote called Start Where You Are also teaches on all of these slogans. And somehow the slogans are the teachings, and then the Tonglen is the practice that makes these teachings possible. Now, the essence of these teachings that Atisha brought to Tibet is bringing difficult circumstances, using difficult circumstances as the method for waking up completely, or you could say attaining enlightenment. And this is why it's such good teaching for our times. Um, And I guess it was good teachings for those times as well. But that's the earmark of it. It's actually using what is difficult, bringing difficult circumstances onto the path of enlightenment. They become the actual basis for waking up rather than how we usually think of it as they become a big obstacle. People say, you know, my meditation would be perfect if it wasn't for my husband (laughs) or my boss or my wife or my teenager or my two-year-old or my... uh, heartbreak, or my ill health, or my uh, current failure, whatever it is, that all of that is interfering with my spiritual life, my tranquility, this uh, peaceful image that I like to have of myself is being wrecked all the time by the fact that life is causing me to fly into rages continually. (laughs) So it's very helpful to have a teaching that says that those very difficult circumstances of our lives are the basis of awakening, using those. Now, Atisha himself heard about these teachings. Here he was in uh, 10th century India. He heard about these teachings, but he couldn't find them anywhere, and he traveled to Indonesia, which I'm sure was quite a feat in those days, would be a feat even these days. And he looked all over Indonesia till he found the one person there that was still teaching these and got these teachings on Tonglen. We have it pretty easy these days. You know, you can uh, see it on video, hear it on audio, come to your local center or whatever and hear the teachings. But in those days, you know, it wasn't easy. So I always feel a lot of gratitude to people like Atisha who are willing to put in all those work because otherwise... It could have just gone extinct. It could have been an endangered species way back there in the 
10th century, it could have just passed away in Indonesia, never got passed on to anyone. But it got passed on to Atisha, and then he was invited to Tibet, and he passed it on to Tibet, where it really took hold. And it, through it coming to Tibet, that it's been passed on in an unbroken lineage to today. Now, the story about Atisha is that he actually got to the point where he liked difficulties, because he thought of difficulties as the meat and potatoes of becoming enlightened. And particularly, he liked difficult situations, just the situations that you and I just despise. He actually liked, because he wanted to see where he was still capable of being thrown off his seat, because that's where he wanted to see who he was, to have complete honesty with himself, no deception, and then to make friends. So um, this word Maitri comes in, this unconditional friendship. He wanted to develop unconditional friendship with himself so that when people provoked him and so forth, and he saw his anger, he saw his jealousy, he saw his resentment and envy and different things, that that was something that he could make friends with, that he could come to know the energy of those feelings, not as an obstacle, but by letting the storyline go. He could, with his basic mindfulness awareness sitting practice, he could sit, and up would come all these things in his life, and he would sit with them. Fear or depression, all kinds of things. So he liked those things because he would sit with those things, let the discursive thoughts, the discussion, the internal conversation about them go, which is our practice to train in learning how to do that gradually over time, how to let, when the thoughts come, to also let them go. He would train that way, and then he would sit with the energy as a felt quality in his body, the feeling of anger or the feeling of jealousy, whatever, and let it somehow transform his being and not spin off into blaming self, blaming others, an endless chain reaction of suffering, but somehow just letting all the chain reaction storylines go and just sitting, moving closer to his own energy. And particularly, he found, and this has been passed along, that these very painful, we call negative energies of something like anger, have enormous energy in them. In other words, it's sort of a fast path to enlightenment because there's so much energy in those emotions that if we're not completely caught up in them and you know, following along with the internal conversation, and then it's like tapping into enough energy to light up Los Angeles, you know, or light up New York City or Paris or the whole globe, for that matter. Lots of energy. So there's this kind of outrageous teaching that sort of underlines all of this, which I'll just throw out for you to contemplate for the rest of your life. <laughs> and that is, the more neurosis, the more wisdom. But it's this idea of the energy that's there, if it's not all caught up in me, and I must prove myself, and I must struggle against this, and the enormous sense of self getting built up out of this energy, if you can let the storyline go, which is not easy to do, but that is our practice, then there is this energy. And somehow it is a transformative energy. So Atisha, he liked difficult circumstances. And then I'll be talking more and more about Tong Len, and this was his main practice, and how he worked with this difficult energy in Tong Len as becoming the actual basis of awakening his compassionate heart. The difficulty itself was what he used, or what was used, what he learned from his teacher in Indonesia to awaken compassion and the sense of shared humanity or kinship with all sentient beings. So it's said that he heard that the people in Tibet were very, very peaceful, gentle, good-natured, just wonderful people. And he thought, oh dear, (laughs) nothing to work with. So the story is that he brought with him his really ill-tempered, disagreeable, ornery tea boy. The Bengali tea boy becomes like this metaphor for all the people in our lives that just drive us crazy. Atisha brought him along 
He could have said, now's my chance to get rid of this guy. But instead, he brought him with him to Tibet because he wanted someone that would keep him honest. This Bengali tea boy apparently was just like your mother or your boss or all the people that, you know, actually you kind of can't get rid of them. They're like the the ex-husband or the ex-wife or the, the person that is, continues to drive you crazy year after year. He brought this guy with him. And then the Tibetans, who do have a great sense of humor, they always tell the story. And when he got to Tibet, he realized that he really need not have bought that Bengali <laughs> There was as much difficulty there as any place. So nothing's changed much since the 10th century. <laughs> well, the uh, teachings on Tonglen were taught widely in Tibet when uh, Tisha arrived, and then they sort of went underground again. And they never were lost. The lineage continued, but they were very secret, and they weren't used that much. It seems like there are times when Tonglen, it's a ripe time to teach it, and there are times when it's actually misunderstood and not so appropriate. And uh, now seems like a ripe time. But in any case, it went underground. And a few centuries later, in the 12th century, there was um, a man called uh, Geshe Chakawa, and he became completely intrigued with these teachings again. And the story is that he was uh, walking through a room and he saw a book open on a bed and there was written in this book, take all the pain for yourself and give all the pleasure to other people. Now, you or I would have said, yuck, what a terrible idea. But Geshe Chagawa was absolutely fascinated with this teaching, like a victory to the others and defeat to oneself or taking in the pain and sending out the pleasure. And he was so intrigued that he started saying, well, wow, is there, can I learn more about this? And again, because the teachings had gone under, he didn't have to go to Indonesia, but he had to look all over Tibet, and finally he found someone who could give him the teachings. And then he practiced them for the rest of his life. And he's actually the one that systematized the slogans so that we have now this book, Training the Mind, or I was able to uh, study these slogans with Trumper and Mache. And the teachings have passed down on the Tonglen practice and the slogans because Geshe Chakawa sort of wrote them all down and made it a very clear, systematic presentation. The story on the Geshe Chakawa is that a lot of his students were lepers. And there was no cure for leprosy. And he taught Tonglen to his students that were lepers. Now, this is very interesting. There's a parallel today with that Tonglen is being taught more and more widely in hospice situations, particularly uh, in AIDS hospices and with um, people with terminal cancer and terminal illnesses of all kinds where you do not expect to uh, live and there's a feeling of hopelessness about your situation. And it's being taught that, for instance, with AIDS, that... um, you do the Tonglen practice breathing in with the aspiration or the wish that your sickness that you're feeling and also perhaps what you know about shame from having AIDS or what you know about anger from having AIDS or resentment from having AIDS or any of the strong emotions that you might feel. You say, since I'm already feeling these, may I feel this so that all my brothers and sisters who have AIDS could be free of it. May I feel it completely so all of them could be free of it. And then sending out healing in any way that seems real and comforting to you. So in some sense, you're willing to feel it so that others could be free of it. And at the same time, it's like acknowledging that you and all the others are in the same boat. And the interesting thing is that The reason that this is being taught more and more widely is that people are finding not that it cures people of AIDS or cancer. It has all kinds of results in terms of healing, but mostly it heals at the level of the spirit, that people feel like their disability, their pain, their despair, their fear uh, suddenly has meaning 
and there's a purpose to it. It can be used as the basis for benefiting others. So back in the time of uh, Geshe Chikawa, he was having the lepers do the Tonglen practice exactly in that spirit. Since I'm feeling it anyway, may I feel this so that all others could be free of it. That I'm feeling it, could that be the basis of all others being free of it? So breathing in and completely feeling what you were feeling in terms of pain and also emotional difficulty and sending out relief to yourself and all the others. So he was having them do this. And uh, the Tibetan story goes that many of them were being cured of leprosy. And so needless to say, lepers were coming to him from all over the place to get cured, and then he'd give them this kind of astonishing practice, which was just what nobody wanted to hear, but people would try it. So Geshe Chikawa, he had his own Bengali tea person, and it was his brother. His brother was very cynical about anything spiritual. His brother didn't like Chikawa, was always giving him a hard time, and basically was a thorn in Chikawa's side, and vice versa. But this brother became curious why all these lepers were coming and why so many of them were going away cured. So he started listening at the door. So it's like he's out there in the hallway. You know, he wouldn't deign to come in here and hear the teachings, you know. Like my brother wouldn't come in and hear me teach, but he's listening out at the door. Or, he, you know, he buys the video. <laughs> Gets it in a brown paper cover so nobody knows. And goes down to the basement, locks the doors and watches, you know, and finds out what's going on. And... Uh, Chakawa began to notice that his brother was becoming much more kind and had better sense of humor and was more flexible and more open. And it occurred to him that maybe his brother was listening to the teachings. And so he talked to him about it, and sure enough, that was what was happening. So at that point, when all of that was occurring, the teachings were somewhat uh, being taught in secret just at this monastery, Uh, It was spreading by word of mouth, but it was pretty much a secret thing. And then he said, listen, if this can help my brother, it can help anybody. So at that point, he started teaching it more widely. So I don't know. Maybe that's why I started teaching it, right? Maybe I have one of these brothers or sisters or something. But in any case, that's the story of how it started getting out and how it uh, got passed down finally to the point where um, Trumper Rinpoche's teacher, who was called Seichen Kantral, taught this practice to Trumper Rinpoche, and then he taught it to those of us who were his students, and that's why his students, such as myself, are able to pass it on to you. So there's this lineage of people who not only became curious about this approach of taking difficulty and having it be the basis of awakening Maitri, which is this unconditional friendship with oneself, and also awakening one's compassion for other people. Not only having a kind of curiosity about that, but actually beginning to apply the teachings, to to apply the practice. So Tonglen is taught as a formal practice, and in our next session we will be doing it as a formal practice, But I particularly feel that Tonglen is a practice which is extremely appropriate and powerful to do on the spot. And what I mean by that is when you see pain out there, when you're walking down the street or reading the newspaper or things in your immediate domestic situation or among your friends or any suffering in the world that you hear about or come in contact with, and that it just occurs to you to begin to do Tonglen, either for the person that's suffering or for the confusion or fear or even anger or irritation or whatever it brings up in you. In other words, when there's pain and your reaction to pain, it occurs to you to do Tonglen either for the person in pain 
or for yourself and all the other people like you that are somehow afraid of pain, don't want to go near pain, somehow have a lot of emotional baggage around pain. So doing Tonglen on the spot when you see suffering, particularly, you know, we have so many situations in our lives. From the time that I was a child, I remember when I was 11, I went with my parents on a trip to Mexico City. And I came from rural New Jersey. And it was the most amazing experience. I remember it so vividly because uh, I had never seen people begging on the streets and I had never seen starving animals. And I was like completely blown away by this. And it would never have occurred to me in my life that in, within my lifetime I would see people begging on the streets in uh, all the cities of North America and see starving animals in the cities of North America. In those days, you know, this was pre-Eisenhower, you know, and this was the 50s, and then that whole area, you know, everything was like, leave it to beaver. You know, of course, in our domestic situations, it was just as messy as it is today, but the kind of pretense was like, uh, leave it to beaver, you know. Everything was like, cheerful and uplifted and clean and, There wasn't a lot hanging out. But these days, uh, death is closer. Poverty is inescapable. Human suffering is inescapable. That's probably why Tonglen is such a ripe time for Tonglen, because we walk down the streets and we can't escape it. And again and again we see things where either we want to avert our eyes and not look, but we feel somehow pained by that, or we wish we could help. We see someone who's black and blue has been beaten, or somebody beating somebody, or we see suffering of all kinds, and and often there is absolutely nothing we can do. And we wish we could do something, and Tonglen is something that we can do. We can begin to breathe in and out with the wish that the person being abused, as well as the abuser, could be free of their suffering, that somehow kindness could come into the lives of these people and also into one's own life and the fear and aversion that one feels about these things or all the complexity of feelings. So doing Tonglen on the spot like that. And then also any time, say we're in an argument with someone and someone is yelling at us, something is going on with us and all kinds of painful emotions are charging through us and we don't know what to do. Right on the spot you can begin to do Tonglen breathing in and out to open up the situation between you and this other person. And you do it for yourself and all the other people all over the world who are being yelled at or who are feeling afraid or are feeling unworthy or feeling depressed or whatever it is that you're feeling. It becomes your link with other people and there's some way to open up and change our relationship with difficult circumstances. And particularly, uh, this is a practice about working with our fear of pain gradually, slowly, at our own pace, working with our fear of pain. So I like to teach Tonglen as a practice to do on the spot. I receive a lot of letters, people writing to me about their experiences with Tonglen. In each of the books that I've written, there is a chapter on Tonglen. And they've perhaps read this, and this is the first time they've heard about Tonglen, or maybe they've listened to this audio tape which is called Awakening Compassion or the one called Noble Heart and there's teachings on Tonglen in there and they've become interested in it but before that perhaps they had never heard about it and they're trying to practice the practice and they write to me and tell me what their experience is. So a man wrote to me who said that he had never heard of Tonglen and when he heard about it he realized that he had uh, without even knowing what the practice was that he had practiced it. And he told me about this situation. He said he was a high school counselor. And in his position as a counselor, he had supported a young woman in her decision, teenage young woman. He had supported her in a decision to leave her father's home and move in with her mother. 
Then he got a phone call from the father. And he described the father in the letter. I imagined it as this uh, guy who was about six foot eight and weighed about 800 pounds. You know, this is like the image. And I imagined this guy who wrote the letter as being about four foot two and weighing about 25 pounds. You know, this is kind of the, this is the situation the man felt himself in. And he said the father was an ex-cop who had been removed from the police force because of his aggression. (laughs) So this was the man that was going to come in to him and have a little discussion with him about the fact that he had uh, uh, counseled his daughter to move out of his home. He knew the guy was really angry, and uh, sure enough, the guy was really angry. The man came in, sat across from him, and just vented. He was furious. And the man who wrote the letter said that he sat there like absolutely terrified. But he said he was so terrified that he, it's sort of like he stopped thinking about anything and he just kind of went blank and he was just there with the guy. And then for some reason, which he never knew what it was, he started to do Tong Len, which he had never heard about, which is that he just started breathing in his own fear and pain and this man's pain, sort of both at once. He said he didn't really think about it, but there was just so much pain in the room that he started breathing in and breathing out and breathing in and breathing out. And the man is like screaming and red in the face and shaking his fist. And all of a sudden, uh, the man who wrote the letter said, out of his mouth came these words, you must really love your daughter a lot to be so upset. And he said, then this great big guy just broke down and started to cry. And so he said, you know, it was like, um, usually he would have defended himself, he would have felt he had to protect himself, he would have done all the stuff that would be guaranteed to escalate the aggression in the room, because that's our normal, uh, that's our just ordinary response. It's like, we're so scared, and we feel so disempowered by what's going on that we try to build ourselves up by, and we say all the things that just escalate the aggression and pain. And But this guy didn't dream up what to say. He just created some kind of space there, involuntarily. It just happened. And words came out that spoke, communicated from the heart. Now, we don't always get these success stories. I have to tell you that right now. <laughs> that there's not always happy endings to these stories. You'll say, I do this and like everything will turn out. That was the first uh, teaching of the Buddha. It's like... Uh, you can't get it all together. You know, you can't get life to work out perfect. It just has, it has its uh, up and down. But in this case, it allows a space for some communication from the heart to happen that's genuine. And so if there's any possibility of communication from the heart happening, it comes out of that genuine space of opening to what's occurring rather than shutting out what's occurring and trying to build yourself up in some way. Likewise, people often will find themselves in that situation and they have a self-image of a do-gooder. I am a holy person. I am a do-gooder. I am a professional person. And then they try to say all these contrived, ungenuine, helpful things to this guy who's furious. And the guy hears that it's just false and that you're condescending to him, and it also escalates the aggression. So we are really good at escalating aggression. And usually we don't really mean to. We mean to try to get out of this awful situation in which we find ourselves, and that's the problem. And so the Tonglen approach and the approach of the Lojong teachings altogether. Lojong means training the mind. These teachings that include the practice of Tonglen and the 49 slogans are called the Lojong teachings. That's what Atisha brought to Tibet, and that's what Geshe Chakawa continued. These Lojong teachings and the practice of Tonglen, they're all about not trying to get rid of the awful situation and what we find ourselves, but actually leaning into it moving toward it, touching the heart of our pain, touching the center of our pain. And these teachings are meant to be done extremely patiently, (coughs) gently, and gradually at our own speed. Somehow, they're not meant that then you say to yourself, I must do this, and therefore you do something which actually you don't feel ready to do. You just do it 
at your own speed, whenever you feel ready to do it, you do it. And uh, it's recommended, for instance, on the spot to do it in lighter weight situations, if it occurs to you, like you're um, just feeling mildly irritated. And it occurs to you because that's a kind of a uncomfortable feeling, but, you know, it's not an overwhelm feeling to just do Tonglen with that for all yourself and all the other irritated people. <laughs> opening the heart is opening the heart. You don't have to, you know, jump right into the middle of, for instance, of the most traumatic thing in the history of your life. I'm going to just jump right into the middle of something which traumatized me as a child, which still traumatizes me as an adult, or traumatized me so that I'm still working with the trauma. You don't have to just jump right into the middle of these terrifying, overwhelming situations. But if you're working with just the milder irritations and discomforts of life, you're training and opening the heart so that gradually over time, without you even really trying, you might find that you have more courage to move closer to the really difficult things. This concludes Part 1 of Good Medicine with Pema Chodron. Our program continues with Part 2.